Hey everybody, uh, thanks so much for joining us for another uh, Chicago Bruseum virtual event. Uh, my name's Liz, I'm with the Chicago Bruseum, and um, we always uh, love that you guys join us here in this virtual space. Remember that this space is yours too. The chat room is um, the place where you can say hi to one another as you would in a tap room in a bar. Uh, share some information, share what you're drinking. Um, I, today, I uh, went near and dear to my heart as we're dealing with Pilsner. Um, this is, I'm drinking Sipe, uh, pre-prohibition Pilsner that I consulted on. Um, Sipe Brewing was big in the late 19th century in Chicago. Uh, Conrad Sipe was a beer baron here and built really a small brewery into a massive one. At one point, it was the largest brewery in the United States. And so I was contacted by a descendant, uh, Lauren. Hey, Lauren, if you're watching, um, to help bring that brewery back. And so this is our, our little baby here, brewed by uh, modern, another modern uh, uh, lager making uh, brewery, Metropolitan Brewing. So that's what's in my glass today. Uh, share what you're drinking in the chat room and uh, share anything you'd like. Um, so again, I'm excited for uh, this conversation in particular uh, to welcome Tom Macatelli. Tom, I, when I was chatting with Tom, I was like, I'm a, I'm a really big fan because I uh, read his book, The Audacity of Hops, um, History of America Craft uh, Beer Revolution, and, and I really enjoyed that book. It was very eye-opening. And in talking to Tom, too, and, and learning more about his work, um, I got really excited about the fact that he actually also wrote a book about wine, uh, American wine. Um, my, my not so secret little secret is that I drink more wine than beer. Um, so that is instantly on my list now. Um, and I am particularly excited, uh, for his newest book coming out next week. Um, and that is a book about Pilsner called Pilsner, How the Beer of Kings change the world. And that is what Tom is going to chat with us about tonight. Um, so enough of me. I'm going to hand it over to Tom, who's going to uh, educate us on many things and do a little interactive trivia here and there. Um, and I won't know anything, so I'm not going to answer a thing. Uh, but anyway, Tom, thanks again for being here. And uh, it is all yours. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate it. And thank you uh, everyone for joining me this evening or whatever time it is where you're tuning in. Uh, I'm on the East Coast. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's uh, a little after 630 here. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a little bit of an introduction, uh, excerpt from my book, and then uh, the trivia, including a fun bonus. Uh, there might be some corny music at the start. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Okay. Looks good. Yeah, that's the music. Okay, there we go. Just make sure it pauses. All right, uh, hi, I'm Tom Acatelli. My last book on beer was The Audacity of Hops, The History of America's Craft Beer Revolution. The second edition came out in 2017. This new book is called Pilsner, How the Beer of Kings Changed the World. It covers the birth, rise, fall, and rebirth of the most popular and influential beer style. I want to thank the Chicago Bruseum for the opportunity to share some findings. I wanted to start with an excerpt. It's on what makes Pilsner so unique in the beer world. And then we'll get to the trivia. The excerpt is from the book's introduction. What really struck me about Pilsner early on was how it intersected with so much in food and drink and in business and society. And I can tell you just from a, as a journalist and a historian, being able to write about, to be able to put it into, to contextualize this beer style in major events such as the American Civil War or the space race in the 20th century was just fantastic. It was a real treat. It's influential. Pilsner is influential not just because it's so popular. The best-selling beer brands are either all Pilsners or inspired by Pilsners, but because it has driven so much change in brewing and been driven by so much change outside of brewing. Pilsner is like the, Pilsner is like the luckiest person you know. One of those folks for whom everything seems to fall freakishly into place. This particular beer style came along at a perfect time for it. 
and then all sorts of twists and turns aided its rise. At the same time, Pilsner has also driven change in other industries, including the automotive, advertising, and athletic in industries. That's what made it such an interesting topic to spend the past few years with. And I hope you enjoy the book and my talk. So for the excerpt, we joined Pilsner shortly after its late 1842 birth in Pilsen in present day Czechia or the Czech Republic. The world had never seen a beer as bright and bubbly as Pilsner. To be sure, there had been pale beers and beers with exceptional clarity, particularly from the part of the world from which Pilsner came, but never one golden like the Pilsner first introduced, first produced in 1842, nor one quite as effervescent. What's more, it was born during a creative supernova in Europe that also produced marvels such as the railroad, the transatlantic steamer, the telegraph, the penny post, and photography. Never mind that the same mid-19th mid century period also saw the rise of tectonic political, economic, and artistic ideas, including Marxism, Romanticism, and nationalism, the last turning out to be integral, integral to the spread of Pilsner be, beyond its bohemian nest. Its home continent's rapid industrialization, and therefore its pivot away from a primarily agrarian way of life, played right into Pilsner's rise. Quote, it was a time of endings and beginnings, of changes of great magnitude in science, social structure, communications, politics, political and economic thought, and literature, the Princeton historian Jerome Bloom would write. These changes led to revolutionary transformations in the way that men for long centuries had lived and thought. And so that's what I mean about contextualizing Pilsner. I got to put it in the midst of this. So it's no surprise that this most transformative of moments in brewing occurred smack dab in the middle of such a transformative epoch. Pilsner was a product of its time and place, feeding off both as the yeast feeds off sugar during fermentation. For Pilsner might have remained a curiosity of Central European food and drink well into the 20th, if not the 21st century, as had so many beer styles, as we all know were it not for the age's scientific advancements and industrial scramble. For one thing, given that it was the color of gold or sunshine, when the next lightest beer styles were reddish or amber, Pilsner looked particularly appealing and unique in both bottles and glasses, which came along en masse just when the style needed them to in order to spread. Were it not for the political tumult in Europe, Pilsner likely never would have made it to America where it mutated and grew, for better or worse, to conquer pallets and production lines worldwide. Pilsner picked the best time to be born and the best time to leave home. In the end, it became one of the most ubiquitous features of food and drink in the modern era, an omnipresence in the business world and in national cultures. When the offshoot of the company that Adolphus Bush co-founded with his father-in-law, Eberhard Anheuser, acquired its biggest rival in 2016. It was the biggest consumer business deal ever by dollar volume, not just in brewing, but ever. When commentators in Manhattan or Washington DC sought ways to describe the typical Donald Trump voter in the wake of the 2016 presidential election, they reached for some reference to beer drinking. And the most popular style in the United States remains, even after 50 years of craft beer, remains Pilsner. So thoroughly does Pilsner dominate the international beer market that large chunks of its history read like a history of the brewing industry itself, particularly in the United States, where the style really took off. In fact, it's almost too popular, a victim of its own stunning success. Quote, today for most beer drinkers, Pilsner is simply synonymous with lager, the British beer critic Pete, Pete Brown explained in 2012. Much of, it, much of it is homogenous, interchangeable. The only real difference is the labels and the slogans. That ubiquity and homogeneity spurred a backlash beginning in the late 1970s that saw styles such as India Pale Ale and Porter, which the rise of Pilsner had nearly killed off, return in popularity, particularly with younger consumers. Since 
Only since the late 1990s has Pilsner begun to enjoy a bogus return stylistically, whatever its sales. It has turned a corner in taste as smaller breweries tackle the challenge of this most naked of beers and consumers embrace the results in assessments as probing as those they usually reserve for IPA, the most, sty the most popular style among the craft beer set. And I mentioned naked beer, naked of beers, most naked of beers. Uh, that's a quote from Garrett Oliver, the longtime brewmaster of Brooklyn Brewery, who once described Pilsner as uh, basically as naked because it's, there's no room for any, any mistakes by the brewer to hide. It's, it's, a, it's, so, it's so light colored and so effervescent uh, and so dry in comparison to you know, heavier ales, you know, darker lagers, that you, know, you have to get it right or people are gonna see what, you know, they're gonna see that leftover yeast floating in the beer. So. This attention has infused Pilsner with fresh commercial lifeblood and likely ensured its health for decades to come. My book tells the story of the rise of Pilsner and all its tentacular glory to every corner of the globe. In doing so, it shows how it survived and thrived while other paler, lighter styles stalled. Neanderthals, to Pilsner's modern human. This book also debunks myths about Pilsner's creation and rises, not least the myth of Pilsner as a Czech rather than a Bavarian glory, a rise that Adolphus Busch summed up neatly very early on. When he was trying to come up with a slogan for his newly bottled Budweiser Pilsner in the 1890s, Busch inverted an old bohemian slogan for Pilsner, the, king, the beer of kings. So that's the uh, excerpt. So as far as the trivia, guys, okay, please feel free to write down or, or drop in the chat room, whatever you want to do. Um, but I don't think we can call out the answers, but I'll read out the questions and the answers, and then we'll see how everybody did at the end, okay? Good luck. Okay. True or false? A monk from Bavaria smuggled in, the smuggled in the lager yeast used to make the first Pilsner in Pilsen in what was then the Austrian Empire in 1842. False. It's a nice legend, yes, but not true. The yeast was purchased on the open market in Austria. Did a lot of people get that? that? That's one that's repeated a lot. So you'll see that um, quite a bit. But just like today, even, even 170 years ago, they had open markets for, home, for brewing supplies. Um, okay. That first Pilsner from what was then known as the Burgers Brewery and is now known as Pilsner Urkel was first distributed in the United States in the mid 19th century in what city? High Point, North Carolina, Brooklyn, New York, which was an independent city then, Racine, Wisconsin, or Baltimore, Maryland. This one surprised me. Racine, C. There was a sizable Czech immigrant population in the Wisconsin city, so it made sense. Where did Eberhard, Eberhard Anheuser and Adolphus Busch first meet? A, a Lutheran church in St. Louis. B, a favorite local pub each frequented in the same city. C, an army regiment they both served in. Or D, at a St. Louis brewery that Anheuser co-owned and at which Busch apprenticed. All right. C. Every indication suggests that the future father-in-law and son-in-law met while serving in a Union Army regiment formed from mostly German-American volunteers in Missouri at the start of the Civil War in 1861. They signed up, there, there were a lot of regiments like this, especially of um, recent immigrants and their, and their immediate descendants uh, at, very early on in the war, which started in April 1861. Um, and they, they were short enlistments, they were three months because everybody thought the war would be over fairly quickly. Of course, that wasn't the case. But uh, Bush 
he, he signed up for th the three months in this uh, mostly German American regiment in Missouri. I don't know how long Anheuser's uh, uh, stint was, but it was probably three months as well. And it's just as well they signed up early in the war because, uh, you know, as, as most students of American history know, it turned very vicious uh, later on and not, not as vicious in 1861. And so, but Missouri itself was a pretty, it was a horrible, it was not, it was not a pleasant place to be in the early 1860s because of the violence. Um, but being mustered out early might have very well have saved their lives and therefore changed the course of what we're talking about here. Okay, this is a good one. Nobody gets this because it's, it's, it's a trick question, but if you get it, feel very good about yourself. Um, when, when did Franklin, President Franklin Roosevelt say, quote, I think this would be a good time for beer? A, when he signed into effect the 21st Amendment. After prohibition. C, to dinner guests shortly before his first fireside radio chat to the nation in March 1933. D, to reporters upon throwing out the first pitch on opening day for Major League Baseball in March, 1933. Okay. C, and I, I wanna thank the, uh, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York for this, because they, they really, they um, tracked it down basically. And I got this guy's memoir, which was great. He was a, a, a personal friend of Roosevelt's early on. Um, according to Ernest K. Lindley, a guest at a small private dinner at the White House on March 12, 1933, FDR remarked after the meal and before the radio broadcast that I think this would be a good time for beer. The phrase is frequently misquoted as, I think this would be a good time for a beer, and falsely attributed to his signing of the 21st Amendment ending prohibition, which he didn't do nor have to do for it to take effect. Whether the remark had to do with the 21st Amendment or with the 3-2 beer legislation that was then pending is not known. It's probably just more that the 32nd president liked to drink. And that really is probably it. Um, and I think he probably said, I think this would be a good time for beer rather than a beer is because it's entirely possible he was used to drinking it on draft. So. Which characteristic did the Gottfried Kruger Brewing Company of Newark, New Jersey, not use in touting its new cans of beer in early 1935, the first time a brewery had sold canned beer commercially? A, easy to recycle. B, no breakage. C, no deposit. Or D, better taste. A, recycling. Recycling as a technology, never mind a moral imperative, was a ways off when Kruger debuted its Pilsner and Cream Ale in cans in 1935. The brewery and others, in fact, encouraged drinkers early on to simply crush the cans and toss them. Often from move, moving vehicles, as cans were also touted as better for driving with a cold one. You can, uh, you can look at these up uh, on Google Image. It's, it's, it's uh, alarming and funny at the same time. But. True or false? Miller introduced the first ever commercial light beer in 1975. False. There had been light beers going back to at least the 1950s, but they'd all flopped commercially or run into legal trouble with their low calorie claims. Miller Light, on the other hand, transformed the industry. Oh, I love this one, okay. Uh, in early 1973, Chicago Daily News columnist Mike Royko arranged what was probably the first taste test for beer in a major U.S. media outlet. Royko and his judges blindly sampled 22 beers, most of them lagers. Which beer finished dead last? Was it A, Schlitz Genuine Gold, B, Budweiser, C, PBR, or D, Rheingold Extra Light? Uh, 
B, Budweiser, which was the best, I think the best selling beer then. Uh, if not, it was awfully close. Budweiser, beers from Western Europe finished first and second. And a Pilsner from Stevens Point in Wisconsin was the highest rated domestic selection in third place. And just, you know, I, I made up the Slitz Genuine Gold. I don't think that was an actual uh, beer or the Rheingold. I know Rheingold had a light beer, but I don't think it was extra light. Okay, this is the bonus question. True or false? The Simpsons fictional beer, Duff Dry, is made through dry hopping and is therefore a hoppier version of the original Duff. False. According to episode 16 in season four, Duff, Duff Dry, and Duff Light are all the same beer in different packaging. Now, um, so this slide is funny, but it also leads me to a uh, final point I want to make uh, about one of Pilsner's greatest contributions to food and drink, and kind of the reason we're all here tonight, and why, you're, and why uh, some of you were talking about going to a, a beer fest later on, uh, and, and why you care what's in the beer, and why you care about the backstory of the brewery and the industry and everything all, all, all together, is because uh, that is... Pilsner became so big, so dominant, so imitated that it spurred a massive counter reaction that's still unfolding. That counter reaction, craft beer and microbrewing. Without Pilsner's rise during the past 170 years, it's unlikely we would have had that resurgence. So I have everybody do. Some of them were tricky. I, I would, I, I, I agree. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or... Um... Whoever said FDR, yeah, Doug, it, yeah, FDR was not much of a beer drinker at all, but um, his cocktail, he had a cocktail hour, a daily cocktail hour at the White House in, um, the, during his administration, obviously. And he was the mixer, and he was apparently terrible at it. He made very, very dirty martinis with basically whatever was on hand, including absinthe. He liberally poured in vermouth. Um, but he had one rule during the, or he had two rules, not to criticize his, his mixing and not to discuss business. So, um, oh, doof. Whoever, okay, extra points for whoever quoted the import doof, which was, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a later Simpsons episode where Mo, the bartender, provides the uh, he he want, Homer's getting bored with the regular Duff, so he draws uh, whatever that symbol is, umlauts over uh, the the U in Duff and calls it Doof beer from Germany. But uh, <laughs> somebody has something. Oh, Pilsner or Pilsner? Uh, uh, the spelling it's it's spelled in many different ways. Just like the style itself is referred to all sorts of different ways, continental lager, bohemian pilsner, Czech pilsner, German pilsner. Um, I, I see an American adjunct. Um, so the, 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 you'll find different spellings. I know the Heineken early on did uh, with, the, with, the, uh, three, with the two E's. Um, I believe Miller Lite does it with the one. And Yes, that's um, that's all I have. Is there a difference in the spelling uh, between like Czech versus German traditions of the the Pilsner? Uh, well, the it, Czech would be would be much different, but uh, as far as our side of the ocean, no, that you're, you're going to see both Pilsner with uh, one e and Pilsner with two. Um, and Pilsen uh, in, in Czech is P-L-Z-E-N for the town, which is a wonderful place to visit. I would, you know, if you're really into beer lore and beer culture, um, you know, it's very accessible. Uh, you fly into Prague and you basically take, I think it was a 90 minute bus. I mean, I fell asleep both ways, but it wasn't that, wasn't that hard to find or get to. And uh, you can walk from the bus station or take a to cab it and get right to the main square. You can 
show you that Pilsner Hotel provides a fantastic tour. It's kind of like a beer, a beer Disneyland. And there are um, a couple bars there that can, that serve, that can are allowed to serve directly from the brewery. And I don't quite know what they do. I mean, I write from the history and the business side, uh, but it's fantastic uh, closer to the source. And that isn't always the case with beer. So, yeah, I was, I was actually going to say, Tom, I never was a fan of Pilsner or Kell uh, stateside. And I ended up uh, finding myself in Prague and, and uh, did some research at Pilsner or Kell and got a very special tour. And, you know, drinking that beer unfiltered, unpasteurized in the depths of that brewery was <laughs> something I will never forget, not just because of the uh, environment and the experience, but because that beer tasted so good and it completely changed my mind on the brand itself. Right. No, I, I, I mean that, I know, I don't mean this to sound funny or, or snarky, but it was just addictive. Like I, the, on the way out to the next day, um, I stopped in for breakfast at this uh, bar just to have two pints. I mean, I, I couldn't, it, it's something about, it was something about the taste there that you can't replicate, at least on the U S or you just can't find. Yeah, and um, just so you all know, um, there—I mean, there is there is quite a bit of um, the way that we often discuss German immigration to the Midwest and the United States and its effect on the brewing industry here. Um, that Czech influence is so uh, important mm -hmm. as well, especially here in Chicago. In fact, we have a neighborhood here called the Pilsen, right? Yeah, which is originally called Pilsen, spelled Pilsen, for that influence, and. Um, at some point in the future, we are going to have a conversation about that specific immigration story related oh. to um, the Czech connection uh, from one of our members of our League of Historians. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, we've got something in the chat room here that uh, Heineken uh, is the same thing. Yeah, I won't drink Heineken here. I've never been to Amsterdam to the source, so I'll take your word for it. But I, I definitely would would uh, get my hand well, to get my hands on that. If I were in Amsterdam. Okay, the, the comment via Facebook Live, most people today do not consider American and international loggers as pilsners. I get this question a lot and ran across it a lot talking with people in the industry and with people who cover the industry. Um, there is uh, it, basically pilsner inspired what, you know, the, the, uh, what some of the industry would call American international loggers. Pilsner was the inspiration for it. And a big part of the book is explaining how this sort of esoteric style that, you know, no, I mean, it came, it was, it was, I, mean, I don't want to overstate, but it was kind of a rocket ship. I mean, it came out of nowhere in in an era when stuff came out of, when the innovative stuff in brewing came out of Northern England or Bavaria, this comes out of Bohemia in, uh, the Aust in what was in the Austrian empire um, and how it, it, this rocket ship just overtook other styles. And so people were trying to jump on and come up with interpretations of it and spins on it. Um, much like you see today with India Pale Ale, with IPAs, um, you know, there's, there's no, there's no one definition. If you want to start an argument, you, you drop among beer geeks, you say, what's an IPA and you walk away. Um, but I, I think uh, that that's a good way of thinking about how Pilsner was thought about for a long time. Um, I, I think any, everybody here would agree that maybe Sierra, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, for instance, even though it calls itself a Pale Ale is one of the original American IPAs. It's sort of like that. Um, Eric is asking if there is anything uh, particularly interesting or surprising as you were putting the book together. Uh, oh, geez. Well, okay. Um, a, a lot of stuff because I, I was not, you know, I was obviously going to be a linear. I want to tell a story. And I love telling the stories. I love telling stories of breweries and brewers and the entrepreneurs behind them and the critics behind them and uh, uh, the trends. But I was just really pleased to find that Pilsner was born in, a, in an era that was seeing a lot of technological advancement. Um, you know, it is, it is beer and it it's brewing, okay? So it doesn't, it doesn't maybe rank up there with the railroad or with, uh, you know, 
the steamship or photography, but it's, it happened in that um, era. You know, I, I tell that I'm, I'm from the Boston area and there's a statue in Boston Common of the first successful use of ether in a surgery. And that was in the same era. Now, obviously the use of ether in a surgery so people wouldn't wake up while they're under the scalpel is a much more monumental human achievement than an than a, uh, effervescent uh, clear beer. But it, it ranks there. It's, it, 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 it is Brewing's contribution to this amazing period in history. Yeah, I, I, I think you'd find a lot of people to argue with you on that one. Oh, yeah? <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the Pilsner innovation is pretty freaking spectacular and important and innovative and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think kind of changed, changed the trajectory for a lot of things, for sure. I was also, what we were just talking about, the, the immigration wave. I was, you know, I, I'm the grandson of Italian immigrants. It's a different, uh, they weren't beer drinkers, the, the Italians, but... Um, but I do go into Pilsner's rise in Italy, which was a remarkable thing in and of itself because of the dominance of wine for so long. But I, I was not aware of the uh, immigrant influence on, you know, not just Pilsner's introduction or even Lager's introduction uh, to the United States, but just on beer culture and how it changed drinking for, you know, and, and how it um, fitted in with, the development of the American palate, you know. I mean, I obviously know, just being an American, that, that this country takes influences from everywhere. Um, and that's a great thing. But I had no idea of the, the extent of that, that immigration played in how we drink. I mean, just how, how, how beer fits into the national culture. So I was, I was really pleased to discover that. That was fun. Um, and probably the last thing was, I, you know, Pilsner and its producers, it became so big and so popular and ubiquitous that it, it influenced other industries. Advertising was, a, was the big, big, big one. And I go into that a lot in the book. Uh, but it also it influenced automobile production, uh, agriculture. And um, I make the case that it also in, influenced in a big, big way, tax policy in the United States and prohibition. Um, I don't think prohibition would have come along when it did or its repeal when it did were it not for Pilsner's rise in the hands of German American brewers and their immediate descendants. So that was fun. I mean, it's, 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 I don't, you know, it's my book, so I'm biased, but it is kind of an epic story. It was cool because my last time I wrote about beer was the audacity of hops. And that's a fantastic story itself. And I was very pleased to be able to update it now. And I'm going to update it again because it's, so much has happened and so much is happening now. But uh, that was just the United States and really only a few, for a long time, only a few regions. You, know, you lived on the West Coast, you lived in Colorado, and you lived maybe in, in the coastal Northeast. But uh, this was, Pilsner's story is worldwide. It's, it's incredible. Did you find any sort of um, references to any of the German lager beer makers trying to sabotage, like any anything happening in in, in uh, Czech Republic or uh, just yes. like Pilsner maker, I, I did, and I, I I cannot. I'm embarrassed. I can't um, think of the. I have a, a example. There was a massive counter reaction in Germany, of all, of especially because they have, as most of you know regional specialties, Dortmunder, Altbier, um, all over the, you know, each, each region and sometimes each little city uh, has uh, its own distinct style. And there were instances of guilds, of brewers guilds and uh, companies getting together to try to stop the production or at least slow the introduction of, of exports from, uh, from Austria of this, of this Pilsner beer. So, um, there was a, a strong reaction back then. And then, of course, we have the craft beer massive counter reaction beginning in, really in the 1970s to its popularity. I don't think it's any accident that craft beer really took off only about, you know, a couple of years, three years after the introduction of Miller Lite in 1975. I mean, there were other factors. There was a legalization of home brewing at the federal level. There was a big excise tax cut. But really, I think a lot of people, a lot of those homebrewers had had it 
when Miller Lite came along and really in a few months took Miller from like eight or ninth biggest brewery in the country to, to, to second behind Anheuser-Busch and really set up our, our modern era uh, for brewing um, at that time. Yeah. Well, I wish I could remember the example, but there was, there, there was a, a big counter reaction to the beer's popularity. As long as I, as long as I know that it exists, that makes me happy. I've always sort of like envisioned this grand like soap opera that, you know, the, the baseline is beer because mm -hmm. there's so much uh, uh, nonsense that happens and certainly Pilsners versus Lagers is such a, uh, um, an intense story. Oh, I, and not I, just in one place, right? All over the, all over the world. Yes. And I, I know that Hellas uh, was, was a, uh, it was an old, it was an older style. It had been, it had been around for a long time, but it was resurrected in the late 1800s as sort of an answer. Because it too is bright, lighter, effervescent. You know what I, what I also find interesting in looking at the, at the, I guess, modern, I guess the historic and the modern craft beer story is that, you know, lagers and pilsers really sort of, of make things happen, not just in their place of origin, but certainly in our country and are really responsible for, for the 19th century um, beer boom. And, and there's so many connections to all these different topics you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But what fascinates me is that history repeats itself. And here you go into the 1970s, right? Fast forward 100 years or so, and it's Pilsners and Lagers again that are starting this off. And then we like, you know, sort of take a, a different road and with um, places like, uh, or brewers like Sierra Nevada, as you mentioned, you start getting on this pale ale train and all of a sudden that sort of really creates a whole different sort of craft beer lover. And then all these lagers and, and pilsers kind of got forgotten, right? And it's only until recently that everyone's all like hooting and hollering again about the pilsers and lagers. And now they're sort of the, the hot style. If right, you don't have, West, or yeah. you don't have uh, hazy IPAs. Right, <laughs> right. Um, the that's the ultimate. Hazy IPA and Ringla IPAs are the ultimate counter reaction to Pilsner, I think. But you're right. I, I think that it's, it's, it is interesting. It just sort of goes in a loop and it's coming full circle now that it's coming back into style, I think. I make this assertion in the book too. And um, I, I was on a, a, a podcast and, and got some pushback a few days ago. But I think that Pilsner is coming back into style, into, into vogue um, as, as a style, you know, based more on its assessment of taste and than sales or whatever. Um, but it's coming back at a time when I think IPA is starting to overtake it as the world's best-selling beer style. Hmm. And I mean start, it'll be mid-century before it does. But I think if current trends in microbrewing and, and macrobrewing, which is taking over more microbrewing, uh, continue, I think like by 2050, 2060, uh, the best-selling style will be IPA, however you define it. That's what, that was the argument. Um, but I think it'll overtake Pilsner. I think people want, uh, as much as they wanted the lighter taste and the, uh, the bubbliness and how beautiful it looked in these, this, this glassware and, bo and these bottles that were being mass produced for the first time, I do think that IPA is going to benefit from much the same thing of like people wanting the appearance, they want that taste, they want that, that uh, hoppiness, that bitterness, that even, even the craft pilsners can't provide as much of. So. Yeah. Hey, I have a question. I have a question for everyone watching here on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Um, this is sort of a question I hate to get, so I'm going to throw it right back at you guys. Uh, but I'm going to focus on pilsners. If you guys could actually let me know what your favorite pilsner is. Um, Either I'll give you two options, either of all time or right now. I would like to know. Um, the, the one in my uh, yeah, that's that's always the answer. What's your favorite beer? The one in my hand. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let me know. I'm curious to know what what that is. Um, because I'm always uh just wanting to explore if I can get my hands on something and try something. Um, I, I get, again, I'll be biased, and right now my favorite pilsner is Sipe. Pre-prohibition Pilsner. Um, what do we have here? Not quite Pilsner, but corn lager. Oh, the, the good old, hang on, I have a question for you beer nerds who are really into like styles and such and who make beer and, and, and brew and know all that sciencey things. 
is it is it is a corn lager corn lager is not always going to be a cream ale what's how how do you what's the, what am i looking for there right there's there's lagers made of corn miller products but then there's also that answer to different kind of lagers with the cream ale um so that's my question to the to the beer nerds who are on here um well, I well, I, I guess I guess it's your definition of lager to begin with. I mean, I mean, pilsner is a, is a bastardized term now, I believe, um, because of its of its usage. Um, it's whatever the brewery calls it. So a cream ale could be could be a, a, oh, right. a pilsner, yeah, lager, could sure. be a lager, sure. you know. It, it's. Mm -hmm. It depends. It's the classic answer. Peter, I like your background. It's a, that's a classic background. Appreciate that. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I, I endorse what Tom said. I went to um, uh, Pilsner Urquell, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And if you get the opportunity after all this COVID stuff, it's, uh, it's a great tour to do and go through the caves and all the rest of it. It's great. Yeah, it's definitely worth the trip from Prague for sure. Uh, Metropolitan Flywheel. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. Pony Half Acre, that's definitely a, 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 a fan favorite for sure. Um, I am not looking at Facebook, but I'll trust Lucas to share some information with me. Oh, Bitburgers. I, I'm with you, uh, Lucas. Bitburger, um, just for the little fancy piece of paper you get on the glass, I think is worth ordering a Bitburger at a bar. Um, definitely a tasty little number. Tom, I have a question in regard to uh, your expertise, your research in studying the growth of American craft beer and the uh, American wine industry. Are there any parallels that you've seen in how it's grown or what, or what oh. people have taken to or what sort of these, these, um, these debates or anything like that? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, the, at least in the United States, the... Um fine wine and craft beer movements or whatever you want to call them trends began around the same time in the San Francisco Bay area uh, in the mid 1960s. Um, on the beer side was Anchor, the rescue of Anchor Brewing. Um, on the wine side, it was Mondavi Winery starting up in Napa Valley. Um, but yes, they, they really grew up in tandem. The remarkable thing about wine, uh, and this was very surprising for me um, until, you know, if wine was much more pedestrian and like run of the mill in the United States than beer in the 1970s, at least, in, you know, there were different, you, you could find interesting imports in the U.S. and imported beer. It was darn near impossible to find interesting and affordable imported wine in the U.S. in the same scale. But wine, you know, wine took off from being mostly sold in screw top jugs uh, to, you know, a, sort of ascending to this cultural pinnacle because of um, a couple of events and some fantastic marketing, really. I mean, that, uh, you know, I don't want to be overly cynical, um, but the story of, you know, the, the two ran parallel to each other and then wine went that way and beer sort of trundled along and has only in recent years, maybe the last decade, 15, 20 years, gotten the same level of respect and um, attention. Would you, uh, say that, would you say that wine sort of went that other way um, because it was really trying to level up because of sort of the, the, the perspective that, yes. that a lot of say French winemakers, right? These sort of like, you know, top tier winemakers looking at Americans trying to make wine and clearly they're, they're making that good wine and sort of kind of trying to market everything so that it's as good as the French, right? This fancy right. stuff. Well, what was interesting is, is American wine was as good as, uh, there, was, there were some producers who were as good as or better than uh, French wines. Uh, in France also, one of the things that worked to the Fr American winemakers advantage in the uh, early 70s was that um, um, the uh, Fr French wine industry was having a terrible time of it. Just awful harvests, awful vintages. Um, but the, the, um, the American industry just didn't aspire to overtake. It was just, it was content to run along. Um, there's a 
there was a, a 1972 Time Magazine cover article on uh, the Gallo brothers. You know, there, there's gold in them grapes was the tagline. Um, it was all about bulk, much the same way that beer is still written, the brewing industry is still written about. It was all about sales and market share and advertising dollars. And then these events in the 70s for wine uh, just allowed it to go, go right through the roof and it never looked back. Um, um, I have another question for everybody on here. Um, are you guys wine drinkers? I'm always wondering what the, the beer drinker, uh, I always feel like beer drinkers tend to gravitate towards like gin, right? But I'm wondering if there are other some wine lovers. Um, and for those of you who are wine lovers on here, um, there is a great movie called Bottle Shocked that I really enjoyed about the 1970s rise of California wine. There's a, a book behind that. I can't remember. Oh, geez. Uh, he was a... Let me look it up. That's one of the joys of doing these at, uh, remotely. Yeah. But I also want to talk about cream ale. Um, yeah. Uh, that, I have that in, in Pilsner uh, as, a, as a, a, a sort of cautionary tale. This was in um, the mid 20th century. Uh, cream ale from Genesee Brewing Company in, uh, in Rochester, New York came along and the green cans and green bottles, if anybody remembers that. And uh, that, that, that was a direct counter reaction. Genesee was a small struggling regional brewery trying to eke out an existence in a market that was increasingly dominated by Pilsner or Pilsner inspired beers. Um, and it didn't, it didn't work. It worked for a time. Uh, Genesee was moving maybe a, a million barrels of cream ale in the United States, which was kind of amazing because its, uh, its distribution was only really in the Midwest and Northeast. Um, but cream ale's, you know, rise and quick fall is an example of the power of Pilsner and how it just sort of swept all before it. Um, let's see, right. I'm guessing Senor Stein is Mike Stein. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lager, I like to call him sometimes. Um, Genesee's package in large tanks. Mm -hmm. Massive tanks. Wait, what, uh, Mike, if you're there, unmute yourself and, 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 and tell me what you're actually saying here. I'm curious to know more. Oh, Chris Merlot. All right, I like it. I like it. <laughs> because your wife needed some for cooking. Hey, Liz. Um, I was saying that I, I conducted an interview with some Jenny Brewers. Uh, one started in the 70s, one in the 80s, and then two in the 90s. They're all retired now. So I interviewed them last summer, and they were actually talking about how cream ale was packaged in these large, um, basically tankers. Mm -hmm. uh, so the size was like... I forget if it was like, you know, 62 gallons, basically like four, like, like two barrels worth of beer, oh my God. something to that effect. Yeah. Where they, and they, and they would send these out to the bars, like in Rochester, maybe, you know, Buffalo as well. But basically they were all like New York bars that they would send cream ale into in these tankers. Um, and then of course you have like the party balls in the eighties, you know, which were like little kegs that like mini kegs that they would send out. I don't know any brewery that's packaging in party balls today, but you know, to, to Tom's point, the packaging to go from jug of wine to like wine with a cork or wine with a screw top, the, the packaging matters in terms of how you sell product. And so that just reminded me, I was like, oh yeah, like I remember there was a time, I, it was before my time going to the bar. I think this was like the late seventies, early eighties, um, where, you know, which, and then the checks like Pilsner Urkel comes in Tankovna, so it's basically the same concept. And to Tom's point, it's like the way in which that Urkel influenced American brewers uh, in regards to cream ale. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. Um, I, I only remember my uncles drinking it in those green cans. This would have been the 1980s, early 80s in upstate New York. Um, but it's a good, that's a, a good point about wine. One of the way, one of the reasons the French wine industry recovered in the 70s, I mean, they, there were technological changes and, and agricultural changes, but uh, most wine in France was sold uh, from the tap. People would bring their bottles to a store. Like, I mean, that, that, that's how, but once it started appearing in bottles, port bottles, that gave it a little bit more gravitas. Uh, the book that I was talking, okay, um, 
that, that Liz mentioned, uh, the book that inspired Bottle Shock, the movie, is called The Judgment of Paris by George Tabor. And it's a fantastic book and overview of the uh, wine industry in the United States in the 1970s. Um, and George was a reporter at Newsweek in Paris uh, and reluctantly went along to this um, blind tasting that a uh, French wine merchant named Steve Spurrier, who had recently traveled to California, organized at a fancy hotel in Paris. Uh, George happened to speak uh, French, which I, the judges did not, the French judges did not know. And I don't want to give too much away, but it was a big surprise when the U.S. wines went up against the French wines. Yeah, right. Um, all right, you guys, we're going to start wrapping this up. So ask any of your last questions. They still make party. Somebody still makes a party ball or like one of those mini kegs, don't they? Somebody, uh, I feel like I just saw one somewhere. But you know, the funny thing is, is you're talking about how, especially with, with well, all, all beverages, right? With its marketing and labels and such. And you go from screw tops to, to um, or to big screw top jugs to sort of more refined bottles with corks. And it's funny how now people are sort of trying to think about economical ways to drink good wine and, and they're moving toward that box wine. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see some, um, some good diversity in, in box wine now. Claudia Hoffbrow. They still make little pony, uh, little party, uh, party balls, huh? That's a look. Doug, what's, what's the party pig? Chateau cardboard feeder. The uh, party pig was another variation. I think it was just a slightly different shape. And I think it might have been a different fitting, but there were even a couple of craft brewers that had that. Well, a couple of brew pubs that had it in the 90s. So it, minor variation, but the labels exist for them. This sounds like a Wisconsin thing. <laughs> fun, quick fun bit of trivia. There was boxed beer in the early 90s. It was a brewery out of uh, the West Coast, out of California. It was a couple, uh, I mean, they've since split, but at the time they, they went through the tedium of individually boxing the beer to be sold. Um, that first. would be interesting to see yeah. again. I mean, I feel like, I feel like anything goes nowadays. Did you guys see today that there is a mustard beer released? Yeah, it looks, uh, it looks terrible. <laughs> it looks intriguing. Let's say that. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, if you have a question, throw it in right now. Otherwise, yes, I know. Try everything once. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, make sure you guys um, order, uh, get Tom's book from um, your favorite source or uh, from a local bookstore. Support your local bookstores. Pilsner, How the Beer of Kings Changed the World is the name of his book coming out next week, August 4th, Tom? Mm -hmm. Yes. August 4th. Um, he also has The Audacity of Hops, The History of America's Craft Beer Revolution out there. Uh, um, that is definitely a classic. Whiskey Business, How Small Batch Distillers Are Transforming in American Spirits. And the one on my list right now, American Wine, A Coming of Age Story, which was, you guys, a finalist for the James Beard Award for Best Food and Drink Book. Um, all right, you guys, thank you so much for being here. As always, we appreciate your support. Thank you. We appreciate your time and, and just, um, you guys always, uh, making sure the Chicago Museum is on our toes and creating content for you. Um, I can't believe it's almost August and, uh, we've been doing this every week since, um, we're going to have a special announcement tomorrow about an August, uh, our August series of events um, that is going to be a very different take on things that we've done in the past, um, but important nonetheless. Um, ChicagoBruseum.org for any and all information. Um, this content is, is free. It's for you. We also have a YouTube channel, so you can access it whenever you want. Um, and when you have a moment, you have uh, some change to spare. Uh, please consider donating to the Bruseum um, and all of our continued efforts. Tom, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate your knowledge and you sharing of your time. And um, I hope uh, the book does well. I'm excited to read it. And I've got 
I got two of your books on my docket for, for 2020. Um, so thanks for that. And again, everybody, uh, appreciate you joining us and we'll catch you next week for the beginning of a new series, which we will announce. It's actually on our website now, but we will make a formal announcement tomorrow. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank Tom. you. Have a good night.